Okay, um, so I've just given you the updated handout with the correct pipe details and uh, that homework assignment, just two problems, that's due on Tuesday the 12th. And we'll uh, take a second look at the hints that I already gave you regarding the uh, nodal method problem with the two reservoirs. Uh, but what we're going to be covering today is the Hardy Cross method. And the reason why we're discussing it is that it's the procedure that's behind the more sophisticated design tools we're going to use all semester. So you're going to use water, uh, water gems pretty extensively on your project. And I want you to know what's going on in the background. You can really run into trouble if you misapply engineering software and you don't actually know how it's getting its numbers or why. So that's why we're going to look at it manually before we head into that. All right, now, on the subject of that handout problem you've got, remember that what you're trying to find on this problem is what's the flow rate through each of these pipes, and then what is the flow rate in and out of the reservoirs. And so, to begin, since you don't know the flow rates, um, you're going to have to use the uh, fully turbulent flow assumption. And so here's the version of the fully turbulent flow assumption. And then uh, I suggest that you calculate R values. And we're going to talk a little bit more about R values today. It's just the consolidation of a bunch of constants together, just to make it a little bit easier uh, to kind of visualize the potential for flow through each pipe. And then the... Uh, the third thing that you do is with your assumed flow directions, you're going to use this estimation for how the energy is changing from point to point. And so location one is the upstream location, and location two is downstream. And so what we know is there will be less head at the downstream location, and it will be reduced by the amount of the losses. Okay, so just to reiterate the process here, is that you assume a direction for flow in each pipe and continuity has to be satisfied and so what that means is you couldn't have the flow going from D to A and from D to B because there wouldn't be any inflow to the junction if you assumed that flow direction so that wouldn't be a logical starting point uh, but what you could assume as a starting point is that maybe it goes from A to C and A to D and then it would have to go from C to B because if you had it from A to C that's one in here another in from that external flow and so you have to uh, make assumptions that aren't going to violate in equals out and then based on those assumptions you'd start with the known head at A and B and you'd find the head at C in terms of this uh, unknown flow through AC. And so the unknown is going to be QAC. And you'd also find out how much head there is at C in terms of the starting head at B and then the plus or minus the differences going up to C based on whether the flow direction assumption was downward or upward. So remember the head decreases in the direction flow, increases against the direction of flow. And so what you're going to do is you're going to relate the head at C going from reservoir A and going from reservoir B because you know what the head is at both of those locations. And so then you'll have two equations, two unknowns. The, uh, the two equations are going to be the continuity equation and then the, the head equations, which you can set equal to each other when you've got the head at C and uh, you solve for the flow rate through each pipe and you know it's valid if the solution you get is real and positive meaning that um, the flow rates aren't negative when you solve your two equations and also you have to keep in mind that the continuity has to be uh, verified and if your equation isn't real and positive if your solution for the flow rate through each pipe isn't real and positive then you have to make a change in your assumed flow direction and try again. And then finally, the last thing that you need to do is check the fully turbulent flow assumption. So um, you calculate an updated F value with the full Jane equation and see 
if the updated Jane equation value you get is within 2% of your initial fully turbulent flow. And if it doesn't fit that 2% limitation, then you have to adjust your R values and adjust your calculations. So um, in past semesters, even when I didn't give all these hints, there were some students who were able to solve this problem in an hour. Um, some people take a little bit longer, but I think the, the wise thing is to get an early start and let me know if you have any questions. All right, so moving on. Um, what we're going to be working on today is the loop method uh, called the Hardy Cross method. And the interesting thing is that this is a, a method for determining the flow through pipes when it's initially uncertain how much the flow would be because it's not determinate. Uh, in other words, there's so many different routes between the inflow and the multiple outflows that uh, the water has a lot of different routes and what we're going to be doing is balancing the energy loss through those different routes because the governing principle that we learned last time when we took a look at the picture of Winter Place, what was the lesson of that picture of Winter Place? Same loss of energy from point to point. That's right. If you're going from point A to point B, you're going to lose the same amount of energy regardless of the route that you take. And if, if those two points are connected. Um, and so that's what we're going to, that main idea will continue to govern here. Um, the process that we're going to go through requires you to start with the guess of the flow rates. And then you have to, uh, your guess of the flow rates has to be valid according to continuity. So generally what you'll have is you'll have a given inflow amount and then a given outflow amount. And then what you have to do is you have to decide how to split the flow just as a first guess. So you know if 10 cubic meters per second is going in in this top pipe then maybe you'd say well 5 will go through here, 5 will go through there. And so that would be valid according to continuity because you have 10 in and 10 out. So that's kind of the first step is uh, assuming some flow amounts and directions. And it doesn't matter how close they are to accurate as long as the uh, continuity is, is honored at the beginning there. It'll eventually converge on the right answer. But it can take a lot of iterations to do it. And in the past, I had students go through some of these examples by hand. Um, but I think we can probably jump straight to the Excel, and you'll have the same understanding of what's going on. And then that saves us time to use on other things later in the semester. By hand is very time consuming because the number of iterations, it can take six or seven iterations before uh, everything's converged to uh, within one or two percent. Um, spreadsheet takes a little bit longer to set up the first iteration, but then after that, once you get all the formulas into the spreadsheet, you can copy and paste, and that's all you have to do for successive iterations. If you have set up right, it'll look at the previous values up above, and it just goes really smoothly and quick. Of course, the computer, uh, you can solve the Hardy Cross method when you're using water gems, and you'll, you'll get a lot of experience with that this semester. Um, so this is what's running in the background when you use the hydraulic design software these days uh, for pressurized flow. And uh, it just, what it's solving for is two things. It's solving to make sure that, that you have the same head loss regardless of route, and it's also making sure that at each junction flow in and flow out are equal. Okay, so the R value um, is an indicator of flow resistance. And the head loss is R times Q to the power of N. Remember, we can estimate the head loss not only by Darcy Wiesbach, but there's also a way to estimate head loss with the Hazen-Williams equation. So the R value for Hazen-Williams, I think, is 1.85. Um, but we won't actually use the Hayes and Williams. We're going to go full bore, maximum accuracy, and use the uh, Darcy Wiesbach equation for our resistance. And so um, this is R. It's going to be the F value, the pipe length divided by 2GA squared 
times d. And so then, remember, normally it's h sub f is f l v squared divided by d 2g. So what we're saying is that's the same as r times q squared, because r encompasses all of these factors that aren't going to be changing directly uh, as we try and solve the uh, flow rates. Now, the one tricky thing is that f does change um, as the flow rate adjusts. And so we have to have a way in our solution of correcting the f value and verifying it. So we'll do that. Just as a starter of calculating the r value, will you just uh, crunch the numbers on this one using the full Jane equation? I think this is good practice. So use the Jane equation to calculate f and then put the f value and all the other characteristics into r. And just in case it's not yet burned into your memory, remember that uh, Reynolds number is velocity times diameter divided by kinematic viscosity. And the typical units for kinematic viscosity in the SI system is 1 times 10 to the minus 6 meters squared per second. <coughs> Let me pull up the solution and make sure that we all follow the same idea. Alright, so first things first, we just uh, summarize the givens here. Uh, it's said that the flow rate is 400 liters per second, so to have all the dimensions consistent, we have to change that to 0.4 cubic meters per second. Likewise with the diameter, and so the cross-sectional area is 0.4418. And I realize, in theory, you could put all of this into your calculator in one giant mega equation with embedded definitions of Reynolds number, embedded definitions of uh, velocity in terms of Q, and I just, I don't trust myself to, uh, to do it that way. I want to break it down in as many steps as I can because I can kind of keep track of things and see if they're going off course. Um, so that's why I took the time of you know, calculating V is Q divided by area, so 0.905 meters per second. Then we get the Reynolds number from that. And then finally, at long last, we put it into the F, the equation for F, with a note that the relative roughness needs to be in the same unit since it's a dimensionless ratio. So we're back to millimeters and millimeters for the uh, roughness and the pipe diameter. And that gives us an F value of 0 0.0242 and then finally into R. So the, uh, the final R value should be 0.715. All right, so this just is an indicator of roughness in a pipe or resistance to flow. And the reason why we, uh, we calculate it is that just aggregating those terms together can sometimes make visualizing the rest of the solution a little bit simpler. So let's move on now to the idea of the Hardy-Cross procedure. Here's a typical given for a problem like this. Let's say we have some network where the water is going in at one junction and it's coming out at three junctions. Now at first glance, is continuity being satisfied so far? In equals out? Yep, I see the heads nodding. So 20 plus 30 is 50 out. Here's another 50 out and all of that's coming from the 100 in. So we need to keep it that way. We need to make sure that all of our guesses always, uh, always honor continuity equation. Like it doesn't try and say that there's more going out than coming in. 
So the process here is to ask how many loops do we have? This is sometimes called the loop method. So there's two loops and we have to consider those two loops individually. We're going to do the calculations for one loop then flip over to the other one and we're going to alternate between the two loops. Uh, so just so that we can have a naming system, let's call the uh, one beneath loop one and the one above loop two. I'm going to draw it here on the whiteboard. So we've got out, 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 and in. And then loop one and loop two. OK. Uh, the end value that I'm talking about is, since we're going to use the Darcy-Wiesbach equation, then n is 2. If we're using Hardy, uh, Hayes and Williams, then it would be 1.85. Okay, define direction. We have to have some agreed upon system for whether a flow is positive or negative based on an assumed direction. Let's use as a convention that clockwise flow is positive. And so if any, if flow is going, for example, from, uh, from one junction to the other, and it's against this positive notation, then we'd assign it a negative sign. And we have to keep track of the flow direction because it affects whether the uh, pressure is going to increase or decrease along that pipe. So that's why we define this direction. And clockwise is positive. So we'll label the pipes and the loops and then assign a guess flow rate. Okay. Um, I'm going to pause for just a moment and what I'd like you to do, that's a pitiful arrowhead. That's a little bit better. Alright, we've got 20 going out at that junction, 50 going out here, 30 going out, and 100 going in. Um, what I'd like you to do is assume, just split the flows, and at each junction, it all has the in and the out has to be equal. So make some guesses. Um, you know, we'll all have different guesses, and that's okay. As long as it all is balanced at continuity at each junction, then ultimately the, the correct answer will arise. But this is something that in my past experience, students have kind of struggled with this initial step of getting the flows to balance at the junction. So I'd like us to practice that. Of course, you, once you've done your own work, then you can check or show what you've done to somebody else. And I'll be circulating around as well. So in other words, how much flow is going through each pipe? If you've got 100 in here, where are you going to send it? Send some of it through this pipe, some of it through that one. And how much? So you actually, what you should do is write an arrow and an amount next to each pipe. So, for instance, if I said 100 is going into this junction, I'll send 50 here and 50 there. But then, what does that mean for the other junctions? All right? So you have to consider if you've got 50 going in here and 20 going out, where are you going to send the, the leftover? Okay, so... Uh, what we could have is that, and by the way, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to label these junctions. I'm going to label it uh, junction 1 on the top left, junction 2 uh, on the top right, junction 3 on the bottom right, and junction 4 on the bottom left. And so 100 coming in, what if I go for like, 30 through pipe 4-3, and then that means I have to send 70 through pipe 4-1. All right, then let's consider um, what's going on here at junction 1. We've got 70 coming in, 20 going out, so that means I have to send 50 through these two pipes, through pipe 1-2 and pipe 1-3. So I'll just split it evenly. I'll just say there's 25 going here, 1 to 2, and then 25 going from uh, 1 to 3. And then we have to just look at what's going on at junction 3. So we've got 30 coming in, 30 going out, 
Uh, 25 going from 1 to 3, and that means that has to give us 25 going from 3 to 2, and so then the two 25s match to 50. And so everything is balanced at each of the four junctions. We, we could have done that a lot of different ways, but that's just uh, one possible starting point. And that's the starting point that I'm going to use when we uh, start on this uh, question here. We're going to use the, the, um, the Hardy-Cross method to calculate the updated flow rates through each pipe. And here's kind of the magical equation that makes it all happen. What this equation does is it simultaneously looks at the flow balance and the energy loss at, um, within each loop. And so you're kind of um, making sure that regardless of route, you have the same amount of energy loss. Uh, applying this equation is going to allow us to make adjustments to our original guess that gets the energy more into balance what it needs to be. And when I say more into balance what it needs to be, what I'm saying is regardless of route, you have the same head losses. Because our initial guess, the way that we have it written on the whiteboard here, if we go from pipe 1 to pipe 3, uh, there's different routes to get there. There's three different routes. And each one of them would have a different amount of head loss with these guess flow rates. And we know that can't be true. Going from junction 1 to junction 3, there has to be the same amount of head loss through each of the three routes. So this process that we're going to be going through brings it into equilibrium. All right, so uh, you know, here's a list of the procedure. I think it's easier for us just to uh, utilize it. And so go ahead and uh, open up your computers and open the tab that says example one. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to be uh, translating the diagram into a table. And so we're on our first iteration right now. So we'll just type in the number one for our first iteration. And you can see that I've labeled this bottom loop as loop one, and the top one is loop two. So let's begin by considering what's happening in loop one. And then the pipes have to be labeled somehow. Uh, I'll call this first one pipe one, three that I'm going to work on. And the n values, since we are uh, using the darcy Wiesbach friction method, n is 2. All right, the r values are given. Just to teach you the process this first time around, but you may have to calculate the r values later on. But uh, the given r value for pipe 1, 3 is 3. That's just right on the sketch. All right, so let's put in... Uh, also pipe 1, 4 and pipe 3, 4. They all have the same n value, but the r values are 3, 6, and 5. Okay, so any questions so far? Yes? Mm -hmm. It's, it's uh, if you could go from one and back to one again through a certain route, that's a loop. So would one, two, three, four, like all the way around the outer, would, is that a loop? Um, it, that is a route that you could take, but we have to split it up into smaller pieces to get the Hardy-Cross method to work. So I guess what we're looking for is the, the smallest enclosed loop for this procedure. So we'll have another one, another example with uh, more complexity, and I think that might show you what we have to do in a situation like that. All right, um, so the, uh, the flow rates that I had written on the whiteboard was that, yeah, I should include it on here as well. Um, so pipe 1, 3, the water was 25. And from the perspective of loop one, that's a positive amount, 25, because it's going clockwise direction from one to three, and the amount is 25. And then pipe one, four, the amount was 70, also positive. 
three, four, you'll notice on the whiteboard it says it's 30. But consider the direction. We said that clockwise is positive, but that flow arrow is going counterclockwise. And so we have to put in the minus sign, and we're going to call that negative 30. So any questions so far? Yeah? When you say clockwise or counterclockwise, do you mean about the middle of the system? Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, you know, from the perspective of the loop, if we say the loop is a route that the flow could be going, is the direction of the flow against our convention of clockwise positive or with that convention. All right, so this next column is exactly what it looks like. It's going to be r times q times the absolute value of q. So equals r times q times absolute value of q. And now, since it's centered, I can't click on that cell anymore. So I'm going to have to type in f14 manually. All right, so r times q times absolute value of q should be 1875. And then you can drag that formula down to apply it to the other cells and get the applicable values for each of them. And if we look at this uh, formula here, this is kind of the, the magic formula that makes everything happen. You notice that we want the sum of r times q times absolute value of q. So let's add that up, the sum of those three numbers. Does anybody have questions? Yeah? I'm struggling to see how the 25 Okay. Down yeah, because right now we're considering loop one. Pretend like loop two isn't there. It's just for loop one. Okay. In the perspective of loop one, it's clockwise, but when we switch over to loop two, it'll be counterclockwise. So common pipes, a pipe that's shared by both loops, we have to flip the sign back and forth. Are there other questions? All right. Next, we'll do n times r times absolute value of q. So n times r times absolute value of q. And we can likewise apply that same function down through the other pipes. And then we also want to have the sum of those. Next is something you're not going to like, but you've got to type in this equation three times manually. You can't, there's no click and drag. We just, it's not that big a deal. It's just, students always think that they're going to outsmart what I tell you you have to do, and it never works. So uh, the delta Q is equals the minus of this divided by that. And then we have to type that same thing in again for reasons that you'll see in just a minute. So equals minus this one divided by that one. And one last time, equals minus this divided by that. The problem is if you anchor the references, then when we copy from iteration to iteration, it's not going to be looking in the right spot. So we need a relative, roughness, a relative reference. So delta Q is basically, it's a first guess of how wrong our flow rates were. It's saying, well, uh, there's too much energy loss in one pipe and not enough energy loss in another pipe. So these are our first adjustment of what the uh, flow rate corrections need to be. So the corrected flow 
is the original guess plus the change. So since the change is negative, you can see that our initial guess through pipe 1-3, I assumed that it was going to be 25. This is saying, well, that pipe is actually, the flow is closer to 4. Okay. So we have corrected flow rates. Any questions? All right. Now we're still on our first iteration, but let's look at the perspective of loop 2. So now here in loop 2, the pipes that we've got are pipes 1-2, pipe 2-3, and pipe 1-3. Okay. And we can uh, type in an n value of 2 for each of them since we're using the uh, Darcy Wiesbach friction method. And the R values will just kind of copy over from the given sketch. So pipe 1, 2 has an R value of 1. Pipe 2, 3 is 2. And 1, 3 is 3. All right, and also let's copy the, uh, the first guess of the flow rates. So pipe 1, 2 is positive 25. Pipe 2, 3 is negative 25. Here's another place where sometimes I see people making a mistake. And it's forgetting to use the most updated version of the flow rates. So on the whiteboard, my initial guess was that pipe 1, 3 would have 25 going through it. But we know better now we actually know that it's not going to be 25, it's closer to 4. And so what I need to do is I need to use that updated flow rate, but here's the trick, we need to put a negative sign in. So we need to flip the sign because remember, if the flow is going from 1 towards 3, that's positive in the perspective of loop 1, but that's negative, so that's against the clockwise assumption when we're talking from the perspective of loop 2. So that is equals, minus, and then I'm going to click here in the reference for uh, the updated, corrected flow rate for pipe 1, 3. And if you don't put that minus sign in, your solution will never con uh, converge. All right. So does everybody have it looking like this so far? All right, so let's just apply the same process that we did previously. And in fact, I don't even think we need to type those equations in. I think what we can do is just highlight this and control C, control V, and it pastes the, uh, pastes the same thing, although this is kind of weird. I don't want to see all of that. That just makes it kind of busy looking. Uh, I can copy this, control C, control V. And it all copies over, although I'm going to, again, change the amount of precision that's shown to make it less annoying. Um, these sums, let's calculate the sums. So I can just do control and copy and paste because it's just a relative reference. You know, it's pasting the formula, not the actual numbers. And so the formula is look at what's above and add it. Okay, the delta Q, I think we can paste that as well. Yeah, so control C, control V, yep. Now I already like where this is headed. One of the things that looks good is when your delta Q is getting smaller. Because the delta Q says how wrong your answer is. If you have a big delta Q, that means your previous guess was pretty wrong and you have to make a big correction. So you know you're finished when the delta Q gets really tiny. That tells you finally everything is converged to the correct answer. All right, so the corrected Q, we can copy and paste that as well. So does everyone have these, uh, these same flow rates for the corrected Qs within loop two? 
Good, I see some heads nodding. Excellent. All right, now let's do iteration two. So I'm going to say iteration two. And this is kind of nice. I'm just going to copy all of this preliminary data because it doesn't change. I'm going to just do control C, control V because I want to basically repeat the whole process over again but just in a second iteration with slightly updated flow rates. Okay. What was the rule that I told you about like when we did this this four this negative 4.24 what was the the guiding principle with what we did and why? We use the most updated value you have for that pipe. And what about the negative sign? Whenever you have a pipe that's in both loops, you need to switch the sign when you move from one perspective to the next. And so what's the best guess we have right now of the flow through pipe 1.3? What's our best guess? Negative 0.374. And that guess was derived when we were in the perspective of loop 2. So now, here in the perspective of loop 1, we need to, again, put in a negative sign and use that best case uh, estimate. So we're going to say equals negative of the most recent one. Okay, so that's our best guess. Where's our best guess of uh, flow through pipe 1.4? 49.24, do we need to put in the minus sign? No, because that's not one of the pipes that's in both loops. So equals 49.24. Our best version of three, uh, pipe 3.4 is this. All right, so now we can do all of this. Control C, we're just gonna paste and it's going to create all these new calculations based on these updated flow rates. So just highlight everything and paste. Oh, it's showing so much precision. It's just messy. Oh, I made it worse. Uh, I keep making it worse. Let's get it smaller. All right. I guess the only ones where I want to see the precision maybe is on these. Uh, all right. That'll be good for now. Okay, so we get these uh, corrected flow rates. Now what do you notice about the delta Q from iteration 1 to iteration 2? It got a lot smaller. We went from having to correct our flow rate by 20, and now we only have to correct our flow rate by 1.5. So that's a big improvement. That means we're headed in the right direction. All right. So now we just do the same thing for pipe uh, for uh, loop two. So you use your most recent guess of the flow rate. So here's my most recent guess of pipe one two. Here's my more recent guess of two three. And I always have to have kind of like a warning to myself, ah, oh, this is that common pipe. I don't want to make a mistake. So it's equals minus 1-3 for that common pipe. Okay. And then I can just highlight everything, copy and paste. The correction factor is getting progressively smaller as our flow balance improves. Now since we did relative references on everything, uh, as we keep moving further and further into additional iterations, then, um, then it's better. Um, it's easier. Um, so how do you know when to stop? On this one, let's do when there's no more delta Q. So let's highlight everything, the whole, the whole second iteration, highlight that, and then control C to copy. And we're going to paste it below 
Now all I have to do is just name that iteration 3. I don't have to do anything else and it's automatically updating all of the calculations. So now we have improved guesses of the flow rates, the uh, changes are getting smaller, probably small enough where I don't necessarily care if the flow rate is 20.757 or 20.759. 20, 20 We're basically converged, but just to get some more practice of that copy-paste approach, oh, that's a little much. Let's copy the third iteration a fourth time. All we have to do is call that iteration 4 and look at how these uh, correction factors are down to 0. So this is the final answer. These are the flow rates through each pipe. And let's check. Pipe 1.3 should be the same flow rate for both loops. 1.512 1.512 1 So everything's good the solution has converged. All right. I'll pause for a moment. Are there any questions? Do I need to come out and troubleshoot anybody's spreadsheet so that we have one that's definitely accurate? This one was too easy. This one was too easy because I gave you the R values. Let's make it more realistic. Michael, do you have a question? Yeah, I, uh, mine came out uh, that be all right. Uh, last year's okay. on the board. I'm curious as to like uh, at some point, so, like our second, third iterations, we had to change that depending on the perspective that we were looking at the loop. Whether we make it the negative of that cell or leave it the same. Is that automatically doing that when we copy and paste those, or how does that work in that? Yeah, so uh, it's automatically copying. The, the location and so it's it's doing that sign change for us and, and we can double check that's good to double check so let's look down here in iteration three it's saying the negative of the previous guess and so one three is that common pipe maybe it would be a good habit if I bolded the common pipes just as a warning to myself that I always want to check and make sure that the sign has changed from perspective to perspective so you have to confine your perspective to whichever loop you're working on. And so let's check and make sure that it's always flipping. 4.2 flips to negative 4.2. Then negative 0.37 switches to 0.37. And then down here, the uh, one, negative 1.1 1 .1 switches to positive 1.1. So the pattern is copying and pasting correctly where it's correcting for the, uh, the sign change. All right, so like I said, this was just to give you an idea of the process. But what's more realistic is if you uh, have to calculate your F values. Um, because the F values depend on the flow rates. And so what that means is that not only are we going to be balancing out the continuity and also the energy losses, but we're also going to get improved versions of the F value as we go from iteration to iteration. So here is a different set of column titles, which I've also put into the spreadsheet uh, on the second, uh, second workbook. This is the problem that we're going to solve. Um, let's assume that all of these pipes have the same equivalent sand roughness of 0.3 millimeters. And what we want to do is find out the flow rate through each of the pipes. And then if we know the pressure at one of these control points at, at junction A, I'd like us to be able to calculate the pressure at each of the other junctions, assuming that their physical height is equal. And so all of the z values are the same. How does the pressure change because of the losses? So uh, as is implied by all of these column titles, you're going to have to calculate the f value before you calculate r. And since we don't know initially how much flow is going through each pipe, our first guess of the F values, we'll use the fully turbulent flow assumption. And then when we do have um, flow rates, then we'll use the Jane equation for subsequent iterations. OK, so on this one, the first thing you have to do is the flow balance. And this time, I'd like all of us to have our own flow balance. So don't use mine. 
Figure out your own flow balance and then use that in your solution. And I want to show you that we can have a wide variety in, you know, for example, by flow balance what I mean is, okay, there's 1.2 coming into D. What if I send 0.1 through this pipe and 1.1 through the other? That seems kind of imbalanced, but it would still work out. It would just take maybe one extra iteration, but I don't care because that's just control C, control V. That's copy and paste. And so extra iterations doesn't worry me. So each of you take a moment to do your flow balance and then start following the procedure as is implied by the spreadsheet here. I'm going to be wandering around for the first few minutes just uh, debugging as you need help or checking your flow balance to see if it works. And then uh, after a few minutes, I'll bring the solution up on the screen. Fully turbulent flow, remember, is what you're assuming for that first round of F values. So we modify the full version of the Jane equation, and we omit the term that has the uh, Reynolds number in it. It should be in meters if the diameter is in meters. Okay. All right, we're out of time, so what we're going to do is save your work, and I'd be pleased to have you continue working on it, you know, like if you're the persistent type and you want to see if you can go all the way, go ahead and do it, um, but we'll spend a little bit of time at the beginning of class next Tuesday on this as well. 
Um, so let's just revisit where we're at. Homework four does not include what we've done today. Homework four does not include the Hardy Cross method. So you already have everything you need to solve those two nodal mode uh, nodal method problems. Um, that's due on Tuesday, and then on Tuesday we'll continue this example and finish it up so that you've got two solid working examples for the Hardy Cross equation. That's it for today. I'll see you next time.